All very serious looking, yes. <clears throat> uh, I think it's recording now. There we go. So welcome everybody. Uh, it's a different time than usual. Um, but I think it's it's nice to be here on a Friday, especially since there's no analysis when I did it, yeah? Brittany, you look very professional. Friday. Yeah, I'm trying. <laughs> TGI Friday. <laughs> yeah. So uh, this week we have uh, Zach Forrest speaking to us uh, about viscosity solutions. Um, Zach is an expert, the resident expert on viscosity solutions, so he'll tell us all about them today. So um, Zach, it's all yours. All right. So thank you guys for having me here to talk today. I appreciate it. I'd probably appreciate it more if I hadn't had the plumbing week from hell. And I'll say that openly, even in this professional seminar, this is one of those weeks where I swear to God, I have snaked about a quarter of the drains in my house. Uh, in fact, I was working on this, uh, this presentation until about two o'clock this morning and was sending a text to Nathan, which my phone did not send saying things like, Hey man, would it be okay if we uh, delayed until the analysis seminar time? Like, it would be cool if we could. And then every student on the face of God's green earth showed up to ask me questions. So at this point, you can look at the top of my screen. You can see that sections three, four, and five are all mysteriously barren. Sections yeah, one and two are not, but three, four, and five, barren. There's a good reason for that. I ran out of time. Uh, I saw like 64 slides, so I think it'll be plenty. <laughs> you want to continue, there we can, can always be a part two if, if yeah. you, you know if you in felt fact, like that, it that's the more professional version of what i'm going to say so on the more professional <laughs> side what i will instead uh, reassemble myself as say <laughs> is i anticipate doing uh two talks on this because there are a lot of definitions you need in order to understand viscosity solutions it is of course an in-depth field Perfect which represents modern uh, culmination of mathematical knowledge, and necessarily it will require care as we examine the details, which just also happens to be very convenient for me. Yes, an extra week to work out the details. <laughs> Thank God for that, he said, <laughs> forgetting he was on camera. So <laughs> let's go ahead and begin. So what we're going to do is we're going to throw a whole bunch of symbols at you guys to begin with. We're going oh, to assume that by S. Sorry, sorry, real quick. Um, I don't yes. know if you can tell what's on the screen, Zach, but we see your entire like computer screen. If you want to like, um, you know, like full page it or or whatever. Yeah. What can, what can you guys see right now? I guess that's a really great question. Yeah, the I see, you know, um, Adobe, like the whole the whole window. Oh, okay. Interesting. Can yeah. you resize that? Uh, no. I, I, I mean, it's not a big deal. It's just, you know, whatever. I don't know if I can get Adobe to only show me. Yeah, see, Adobe doesn't like to get rid of toolbars and stuff. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. No, no, no. Don't. Uh, Control, -L, Control, -L. Um, Control L should work. Control mm -hmm. L? Yeah. Oh. Hey, look at uh, that. You learn something new. The more you I have know. learned something new. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Okay. okay, so I'm going to throw a bunch of symbols at you right off the bat. So the very first thing we're going to do is we're going to set for this entire talk SN to be the collection of all symmetric N by N matrices, and we're going to order it using positive semi-definite properties. In other words, X uh, is less than or equal to Y when Y minus X is positive semi-definite in the sense of matrices. And what we're also going to do is consider continuous functions f, which map from Rn cross R cross Rn cross Sn to R. That is a hideous mouthful, but you don't have to think of it as a hideous mouthful because actually what I really want to say is written below. Let me see if I can, uh, come on now, show me my toolbar, piece of garbage. <laughs> That's All right. my fault today. Yep. <laughs> because if you look here, when I say... I, uh, at Rn, what I really mean is an initial point x, a base point. When I talk about R, I mean the value of a function. When I talk about Rn and Sn again, what I really am talking about is the derivatives of my function u. And the reason I'm doing this is because I want to, it's my eventual goal, to treat f not as a mapping from this weird Cartesian product space, but instead as an operator on you. It will be an operator that takes you, spits out a real number, and we're going to compare it either to a constant C, or sometimes you'll also see people compare it to maybe a continuous function F. 
This is going to necessarily be, by the way I've set it up, a second order partial differential equation. I haven't added a lot of details yet here because I specifically want to start broad and kind of narrow in. See, anybody who's worked with PDE at all will know that part of my goal here is to try and find solutions, of course, that's obvious, but also to find out when they exist and if they are unique. Classically speaking, oh no, now I am undone. Maybe, aha, no, I'm not undone, take that. Classically speaking, I would of course be looking for C2 solutions. So the question is, how frequently am I going to actually find C2 uh, solutions existing to either one of these equations? And the answer is actually not as frequently as we would like. There are some conditions under which uh, solutions do exist, but it is a much more complicated situation. We need a whole bunch of theorems and situations like that, like lax milgram and we don't really want that. So instead, we're going to turn to the notion of weak solutions of a type. Typically, when you hear weak solutions, and I'll review this probably next week when we get to section three, but when I talk about weak solutions, generally speaking, what I mean is functions that have Sobolev derivatives. They're distributionally differentiable functions. Yeah, I can already see Brittany making odd faces here, but the long and the short of Sobolev derivatives, and it makes you look really clever is, if I take a function, let's say u, that has Sobolev derivatives, and I multiply it by, let's say, the derivative of some smooth function, eta, what I should be able to do is rewrite this equation with a negative on the outside, like your normal differentiation by parts, integration by parts, excuse me, and change it to, on the inside, eta times v now. If you have this relationship, V is said to be the weak derivative, the Sobolev derivative of U. Now, if you look at that little equation I've scrolled here, hopefully you can see that there is automatically some issues with this. The issues are we lose all information about the pointwise behavior of our function U, and we also lose information about the behavior of the derivative. After all, we have lots of integrable functions which have very wild behavior, but on average, they behave nice enough so that we can take integrals of them. Having a weak solution then means that we lose a lot of that pointwise behavior. It's not nearly as nice as having the pointwise properties of your normal derivatives. So the question becomes, could we define a variety of weak derivatives and weak functions, weak solutions to this equation with a property that somehow I won't say how yet, somehow they preserve pointwise properties. Brittany, go ahead. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, I, you, you, before you actually wrote out um, on the previous slide, if you could go back one quick. Yeah, of course. I have a quick question, yeah. Um, assuming it lets me, apparently it may not let me. Oh, there it goes. Oh, and it's not, it's not it's not there, but whatever. Um, before you started, you know, writing out, um, ex, you know, explaining what that meant um, formally. And actually, uh, you, you mentioned, like, you said a sentence that I can't remember, <laughs> like an intuitive idea. I understood that better than... The integration by parts thing, yeah? Yeah, yeah before that, you mentioned, so I, I can't remember anymore. I don't... I'll try and answer the question that you don't remember. It. Yeah, I, I know my question's so vague. I'm sorry. I don't... <laughs> That's okay. Okay. So what I said is a lot of times what we try to do is we try to take our second order differential equation and we relate it to integral equations. When we're doing that, we're going to end up finding out that you don't really need differentiability per se, not in the classical sense. Instead, what you can do is you can replace differentiability by a property that looks a lot like integration by parts, which ends up looking like this. In a situation like this, the function V ends up being a weak derivative for you. <clears throat> and in the tradition of integrable functions, its behavior pointwise is not known. All we really know is that when you have a nicely behaved Sobolev differentiable function like U, it turns out that whenever I take V and I integrate it like that, the result is finite or maybe P finite if you need. 
Unfortunately, that means that we no longer have pointwise behavior. We don't have pointwise behavior for U. We don't have pointwise behavior for V. And a lot of times, especially when we use calculus properties, we really, really want pointwise behavior. So the question becomes, is it possible to preserve a certain amount of pointwise behavior to our solutions while still having this idea of weakening our requirements on the solutions? That's really the game here in PDE in modern times. I had said something earlier about Dima's comments on PDE, which I won't repeat since he's not here and I don't want to waste a good comment. But the fact of the matter is that in modern PDE, the game becomes what am I willing to give up in order to prove that a solution exists? Once I've given up enough information or enough requirements to get the existence of a solution, what do I still have? So our question is, what do I have to give up in order to make sure that I have solutions but it turns out that they have pointwise behavior that's almost like normal der uh, derivatives. Is everybody okay with that? Yeah, so in particular, I have a question because I, I, I wrote some of this from Geometry Seminar. Okay. So at, at least for um, linear elliptic equations, it's enough, I mean, what, I think you said lax milgram is enough to guarantee pointwise everything because of elliptic regularity. You're probably right for linear elliptic equations because in that sense- about non-linear, yeah? Because that one, that is, uh, such a nice case. In general, the sort of uh, equations that we're going to consider are going to be much broader and much more general than linear elliptic. In particular, nonlinear, yeah. In particular, nonlinear or quasi-linear to throw around really nice phrases that make you sound very clever. Uh -huh. So uh, for example, and of course, I like to talk about this a lot. So you guys know this. If I take the P Laplace equation, which looks like- We were all waiting for it. Yeah, here we go again, right? So if I take the uh, divergence of the norm of the gradient of u raised to the p minus two times the gradient of u, and I set it equal to zero, this right here is an example of a very not nicely behaved, nonlinear, not elliptic, but almost elliptic looking equation. I'm not going to define that very strongly yet because I'm going to have actual definitions later. But the point is we want to solve equations like this, which are not linear. In some ways, they are almost linear. And I need to have tools to do it. Good enough for now? For now. Linear, linear? Quasi linear. Oh, qu right. You said, I'm sorry. <laughs> and in fact, actually, I'll point this out while I'm here. Uh, let's see. I want to get rid of the eraser. Jesus Christ. I mean, nice things. <laughs> Cheese and crackers. Cheese and crackers. I don't know why it doesn't want to undo the uh, eraser now. That is a pain in the butt. Oh, well. Uh, there is a, actually a book I can direct you guys to that talks about equations like the P Laplacian, but it doesn't just have the P Laplacian. A lot of times P Laplacian is cited as the granddaddy of such equations. <laughs> there are divergence form quasi-linear operators based upon uh, some function A. All right. Oh, and let me go ahead and mention this now. Uh, I wanted to mention this earlier and I forgot because I am a little punch drunk from staying awake until two o'clock in the morning, but yes, treat this almost like the analysis seminar. Interrupt me, interrupt me as much as you like to ask questions. If I'm going to spend today claiming that the reason I'm just focusing on sections one and two is all for your benefit, I might as well go ahead and actually benefit you guys somewhat. <laughs> this is the plan. <laughs> The more questions we ask, um, you know, the slower I can go and the less yeah, likely no, that we'll no, read but, but no, it's all, it's all, you know, <laughs> all so I'll throw you free. What's quasi linear? Say again. What's quasi linear? So quasi linear, I'm not going to define for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is I don't have a good hard definition for you. But when we're saying quasi linear here, we mean that parts of it are going to be linear and other parts are going to be distinctly nonlinear. Uh, so. Let's return for a second to the P Laplacian. The P Laplacian actually has a non-divergence form and the non-divergence form uh, is gonna look like, let me see, it's gonna look like, um, let me think how I wanna say this. So it's gonna be two Laplacian, the gradient of U raised to a power of P minus two of U minus and then minus, a uh, gradient of u to a power of p minus four times p minus two times um, 
the infinity Laplacian like that. Parts of that equation right there, parts of that expression are linear. Other parts of it are not. That's what we're talking about when we say that these are quasi-linear equations. Parts of it are, uh, parts of it are not. Sorry, what, what's infinity uh, Laplacian? I've never seen this notation. The infinite Laplacian? Yeah. Oh, the infinite Laplacian is another classical example of the sort of operators that we're talking about, actually, even in this presentation. So when I say the infinity Laplacian of U, what I'm actually referring to is Hessian of uh, U acting on gradient of U, inner product with gradient of U. And it comes from taking P Laplacian, essentially taking an appropriate limit P goes to infinity, yeah? Yes, uh, Nathan has got it exactly. What happens is as long as I let P go to infinity, I can actually prove that the infinity Laplacian is the limit formally of the P Laplacian. And another example, I think, if I remember correctly, um, is of, of all these kind of general elliptic um, quasi-linear equations is, uh, what is it called? Mean, or not mean curvature, uh, what is it called? It's called minimal surface equation, yeah? Yeah, minimal surface equation is, I believe, uh, Robin's equation is, uh, porous medium equation is, there's actually a huge number of them. I have a handful selected that I'm going to talk about in a little bit when we actually have our definitions. Uh, but I can also point you to more. Most of this is going to come directly from the user's guide. So that's a really good place to look. You all have associated variational problems. That was kind of a, something that I was thinking about. That's another really good question. Uh, so that actually is touching more upon the section three stuff. So I suppose this is when my week comes back to bite me uh, and all of my hopes are dashed. But what Nathan's talking about is this. Sometimes when you have an operator F acting on U is equal to zero, and then maybe you make this a Dirichlet problem. So you say U is equal to G. This will be uh, in a domain omega. and This will be on the boundary of omega like this. You'll find out that there is a backwards and forwards relationship between this and an appropriate integral equation, specifically a minimization problem. So you'll have something like um, min of integral of some expression involving u dotted with uh, a test function eta like this. That's actually where your weak solutions come in. I kind of danced around the topic previously, but what happens is if let's say F right here, uh, let's see if I can change color really quickly. Gosh, darn you. Let's say that F is second order, kind of like what we're talking about. Well, when you come down here to E, you'll find that E is first order or maybe even lower. Solutions to the minimization of the integral problem should end up giving us, under the right circumstances, solutions of the Dirichlet problem, but the order of the operators is different. This is why you need weak derivatives, because when you have these weak derivatives, it lets you kind of make sense of the relationship between them. Now, Nathan's question was, does every single one of the operators we were talking about, the others related to the sort of functions F that I'm going to be discussing, have an energy integral reformulation? And unfortunately, I don't have a good answer for that. I know that infinity Laplacian, P Laplacian, P of X Laplacian all do. Uh, infinity of X Laplacian does, in fact. But yeah, surface equation does. It has surface equation. So there's a whole bunch that do. I wouldn't go so far as to say they all do. Um, that is actually a really great question, and it's one I'd probably have to talk to Tom about and see if he has more wisdom to bring to the table. See, this is great, you guys. We're still on slide two. For... It's perfect. Yeah, if this was our analysis seminar, you would be done by slide three. So, <laughs> <laughs> you guys are pulling your weight. Good work. <laughs> I, it, you know, works for us too. <laughs> All right. So here we go. To remind you, we're trying to figure out how to weaken our uh, requirements on our PDE, but still have point-wise behavior. So is it possible? Well, the answer is that under the correct assumptions, yes. What we're going to be able to do is define uh, solutions which are not necessarily twice differentiable. 
Uh, they actually have a notion of comparison that they carry along with them under the right circumstances, and that will allow us to prove both existence and uniqueness if we're careful in how we apply it. Specifically for me, I'm interested in uh, Dirichlet, which are uh, basically elliptic problems for me, and Cauchy Dirichlet, meaning in this case parabolic problems. And then they're also going to have pointwise derivative-like properties in heavy air quotes. And we'll see what I mean by those heavy air quotes in a little bit. So here you go. This is our table of contents and it gives you a basic idea of how the talk is going to be laid out. In section one, which is the larger of the sections we've got right now, we're gonna be talking about our, de our definitions and our initial examples of how we find this stuff. Uh, once we get to section two, which is where we're going to stop today, I believe, we will be talking about the maximum principle for these sorts of weakened solutions and what's called the theorem of sums. It's also going to allow us to produce a comparison principle. Next week, we're gonna try and move on to comparing what we've uh, produced today through our definitions to things like um, potential theoretic weak solutions and general weak solutions, maybe Sobolev solutions, uh, solutions in the distributional sense. Uh, then, because of Nathan, we'll probably try and do something with Perron's method. We'll actually prove Perron's method, if we can, for what we're working with. And then, if we have lots of extra time, I may even get a chance to talk about parabolic equations, which is what I'm currently working on in my research. Okay, so we're going to take F as before. It's continuous, it's based upon, and I may as well go ahead and write this down again, just so we all remember something from Rn, something from R, another something from Rn, by which I mean in this case a gradient, and then a matrix, symmetric, n by n. It's continuous in each entry, but I'm going to have to require more of it. In this case, what I'm going to require is that it satisfies what I'm calling inequality 1.1, where we have R less than or equal to S, and also we have X is less than or equal to Y. I think I already mentioned that whenever Lyon's name pops up on papers, you find out that everything is super dense, maybe denser than you normally would even see. So I've actually also broken this out a little bit less succinctly. So we can take 1.1 and break it down into two pieces. First of all, we should be able to see that nothing else being changed, our function F is going to be increasing in the real portion. So if you have a real coordinate and it increases, your value of F should also increase. And the second slightly stranger portion is that if I have two matrices, X and Y, X is less than or equal to Y in the sense that we've already introduced, then nothing else being changed. When you plug in Y and then plug in X, you should increase from X R eta Y to X R eta X. So sorry, real quick, um, our, our um, notion of uh, X being less than or greater than uh, Y, uh, their difference is something that's positive, semi-definite? Yeah, maybe? so let's, okay. let's actually talk about that. I had a feeling that would be something I'd be coming back to. Mm -hmm. So when I say that uh, a matrix A is positive, semi-definite, what I mean is that A acting on eta acting on eta as an inner product is greater than or equal to zero. So when we say X is less than or equal to Y and we're using this positive, uh, positive semi-definite idea, what we're saying is if I take Y and I subtract X, so now I have a new symmetric matrix N by N, I apply it to uh, C and then take the inner product with C, the result should always be greater than or equal to zero. This is just one of those things that you have to kind of peel back like the layers of an onion or an ogre when you're doing yeah. <laughs> So just to make sure um, I completely understand, essentially this condition guarantees that the associated PD um, is, if it, in the case where it actually defines linear PD is elliptic, yeah? Yeah. In a sense, basically, so what we call these conditions when we put them together is actually, uh, so the real name, if you read the paper, is that any, 
any function f that satisfies 1.1 is what we call proper. However, usually you'll find out the people who work with this stuff, they don't actually call this proper. They have a tendency to kind of think of this right here as proper, and they call this second requirement right here degenerate elliptic. It's not exactly elliptic. It's something that looks a little bit like elliptic, and we call it degenerate elliptic. So the second one still give you maximum principle, right? Something analogous to it, yeah? Yeah, it's going to end up leading to something that we can use for maximum principle. It's going to require more, but this is the start. Uh-huh. And so then this just uh, this definition is just introducing exactly what I said before. If F satisfies 1.1, and I'll flip back really quickly. In other words, it's increasing in the real component. A lot of times it's said to be proper, even though that's not exactly what the original paper calls it. And if F satisfies 1.1B, this a degenerate ellipticity thing that we call it degenerate elliptic, and if it satisfies both, a lot of times we call it proper and degenerate elliptic. I'm um, sorry, uh, degenerate elliptic, um, uh, maybe this is a silly question, but just what, what does that mean exactly? Or does it not, I don't know. Well, technically- I mean, speaking, yeah, technically, yeah, it means that, but for, yeah, I don't know. Degenerate um, in what sense and elliptic in one sense, I, I don't know. That's a good question. I know that uh, the authors of the user's guide have some comments as to why they call it that way. Uh, Crandall yeah. in particular, Crandall has another paper on the same topic called Viscosity Solutions of Primer. And he also talks about it a little bit and gives some history as to why they name it that way. Um, I believe that what it comes back to, and Nathan had kind of hinted at this as well, is that when we talk about a, uh, functions f that satisfy these sorts of inequalities, we actually are also saying that things like first order uh, partial differential equations also are going to be considered proper and degenerate elliptic, as long as they're increasing in their real components. It seems weird, but even some so, linear equations are going to count under this particular definition. And I we want that to... specifically. Can I comment from my knowledge of linear PDs? Sure. Please. So um, at least from my perspective, historically where it comes, um, people have for a very long time studied, you know, linear PDs because I mean, that's all people knew how to do. Uh, linearity is something that's workable. And I think sometime in the mid fifties, probably maybe earlier than that, um, some pretty powerful theorems have been developed with respect to equations that are called elliptic. You can think elliptic means something that looks like the plus equation. Basically. Um, can we start with that? What I, I like, I, I understand these formal definitions and whatever, you know, again, maybe this is just silly to ask, but an elliptic equation, just what is the, I don't know. Anything like, that looks like an axe like Laplace equation. And it's the important property that they have is this thing called maximum principle. It allows you to do, well, Zach will soon tell us a lot. Uh, okay. Yeah, you yeah I mean, stop the, me if I'm, I'm asking like, you know, very trivial or elementary questions. I just, yeah. No, these are good. Um, this is really supposed to be like an outreach sort of presentation, right? I show you guys what it's like to work in this stuff. You guys get to ask me questions about it. And while I won't say no question is too silly because we all know that that's not 100% true, I will say that I will even consider answering silly questions. Okay. <laughs> so as it turns out, I was actually looking through Evans last night while I was working on this stuff. And uh, a lot of times when you're talking about elliptic equations, you're talking about equations uh, that look kind of like this. Uh, so we'll say I equals one to N, uh, B, I, U, X, I, and then plus some other bit here that we don't care about. Well, what you can do is you can think about, and I might as well change colors when I talk about this, you can think about all of these entries here in the very first sum as if what they are are entries of some matrix A, like this. And in this case, what we're requiring is that 
A is positive semi-definite. So it kind of comes back to what we were talking about before. Now, when you have an equation that's like this, it actually turns out to be a little bit nicer. A lot of times equations in this format are uniformly elliptic as opposed to degenerate elliptic, which means that they're much more nicely behaved. But the same basic principles apply. And as Nathan pointed out, when you have elliptic equations under the right circumstances, you can have comparison principles and maximum principles. And we're going to try and do the same thing, but with less information. All right, so let's see, uh, come back here. All right, we have our definition of what it means to be proper and degenerate elliptic. And I have some examples of operators here that I wanted to put in front of you. So any uniformly elliptic operator, of course, is going to be degenerate elliptic, elliptic and proper. So that's the type we were just talking about. P. Laplacians, my absolute favorite. They're, of course, going to be uh, proper and degenerate elliptic. First order equations increasing in the real component. I mentioned that one already. Hamilton, Jacobi, Bellman equations, which are really complicated things. You see them pop up sometimes. Um, I'm trying to think, Nathan, help me out here. There's a, there's a general area where they pop up. I want to say it's control theory predominantly is where you see these. Sure, that classical mechanics, kind of the, that area. Uh, obstacle and gradient constraint equations also pop up in this. And the list goes on and on and on. In fact, in the user's guide, the first... I want to say pretty close to uh, seven or eight pages of actual work is nothing more than listing every single possible example they could think of and explaining why it works. Um, you mentioned user guide a couple times now. I'm sorry, maybe I missed this at the beginning. This is a book. I mean, you mentioned chapters and so on. So, oh, sorry. Uh, let me oh, see. Okay. This is. Do you have the link up, Zach? Uh, I do not have it, but I can I'll find it if you guys um, want. I will. I'll post it in the, the chat. That is a okay, good thank, idea. Thank you. Thanks. The user's guide to viscosity solutions. Okay, this is sounding familiar now. I'm sorry. I, I'm also lacking sleep, so I apologize. That's where I'm finding all this stuff. And then the authors are Crandall, Michael Crandall, Hitoshi, Hit, it's, yeah, Hitoshi Ishii, and uh, Pierre-Louis Lyons. And this is actually a very recent work. Uh, as I recall, it hails back to 92. Oh, yes, very recent. <laughs> I mean, mathematically, this is interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so you know what? If you feel old, don't feel old. Feel young. <laughs> Everybody in this chat right now is probably pretty close. I'm to older than that book. <laughs> but not by much. Uh, yeah. All right, so I'm actually going to leave this alone. I don't see any point in uh, getting rid of it. All right, so now let's suppose for a second that we have a proper and degenerate elliptic F. Let's suppose that we have a smooth, well, C2 for us, solution to that equation of form E1. And whenever I say E1 here, what I'm talking about is an equation that looks like F acts on you and the result is a constant. And I'm just going to assume for simplicity, the constant is zero. That'll make things much easier. It doesn't have to be that way, but it does make things kind of nice to talk about. And uh, what interesting things can I do when I have a C2 solution of an equation that looks like that? Well, let's suppose for a moment that I also happen to have, I'm lucky to have in this case, uh, a vector, eta, and a matrix in Sn, and that at some fixed point x naught, what I find out is that they satisfy this Taylor's theorem looking inequality right here as x goes to x naught. I really do mean Taylor's theorem when I'm talking here, because usually were we talking about the Taylor's theorem, of course, this would be equality, not inequality. We would expect this right here to be a gradient, and then we would expect this here to be the Hessian, like that. So in this case, all I've done is I've replaced eta 
or I've replaced the gradient by eta and I've replaced the Hessian by some matrix. I want to assume for right now that I've got a situation like this arising. And the question becomes, what could we ascertain from this inequality? Seems like this is kind of a very vague sort of question in a vague situation, but it's really not as vague as it seems. The very first thing is that when x is equal to x naught, the left and the right hand sides have to be equal to one another. Seems kind of clear. Uh, another thing which we can notice here is that the right hand side, the right hand side is basically a polynomial, a C2 function. And what we're finding here when we're looking at these things together is that the right hand side is greater than or equal to our function u. So if here's u uh, changing color to, let's say, blue, here's our right hand side. And it kind of touches our function like so, meaning that at the point where these functions touch, which would be x naught based upon our first point, our basic okay. knowledge of derivatives is telling us that what should happen is that the derivative of the function in blue and the derivative of u ought to be the same as one another. May I ask a question? Yeah, of course. So the notation little o, it's a function uh, uh, of this thing, right? But uh, it could be negative. So I don't think this inequality holds. Uh, right. So I'm trying to think if that is. It holds close enough. That's the point. That's what the little O is for. Yeah. yeah but it can be smaller because I think, uh, but I think totally they are true. So it's in a small enough neighborhood. But it's argument. Um... But this inequality, like the right hand side can be less than left hand side if you use this notation. It could be potentially. But in this particular case, we're assuming that is not what happens. We're assuming for the sake of argument that what we've got here is a situation where the right-hand side does hold. So it's in a small enough neighborhood for them. Um, the yes, but uh, it's, uh, cause it depends because uh, this all, all, this functional term could be oscillating, but uh, maybe in this case, it's just- uh, No, it's, like Taylor's. it's the same as Taylor's theorem. Yeah, but uh, depends the solution. Could it be uh, decreasing? That's fine. It's fine. Sorry, what it? What but is this O again? It doesn't matter what it is. The oscillations are small enough that that term doesn't matter. Okay, so for the sake of anybody who isn't familiar with this notation, whenever I yeah, write not. little O of let's say g, I'll write f of x is equal to little O of g as x goes to x naught, where x naught doesn't actually have to be a fixed point in Rn. It actually could be something else. Sometimes you'll even see people talk about it going to infinity. What I'm really saying is, if I take f and I take uh, g, I divide it like this, I take the absolute value, that this should be uh, less than epsilon for x near x naught and arbitrary epsilon. Exactly. So in other words, what this is saying here is that g decreases, uh, f decreases faster than g, really. OK. So when I say something like little o of the distance between x naught and x squared, what I mean is that the last part is a function that decreases so quickly, it, it decreases faster than the square of the distance between x naught and x. Okay. This also appears in Taylor's theorem. You maybe don't always see it exactly that way. A lot of times people like to simply write by Taylor's theorem, uh, u of x is approximately equal to, and then they cross out all of this stuff here with the little o notation. But the true Taylor's theorem says that the little o notation is there to stay and it's significant. And Fudong, it is possible depending upon the matrix X and upon the vector eta 
So for our purposes right here, we're putting on our imagination goggles and pretending in this particular case it does work. And then we're going to find cases where we do not have, well, when we will have this happen. It's not guaranteed to happen always, which is kind of what you're noticing here. It is not a guarantee. It may not even be a guarantee uh, at infinitely many points, but it will be a guarantee at some points and we'll see how, where, and when. Okay, so hopefully you guys believe me when I say here that if I write the right hand side as the blue function in my little doodle that I have put here, the function u is my red line, and I have my point x naught, that this is basically the situation. The right hand side is almost like some kind of quadratic polynomial just looking at it. And it looks like what it does is it comes from above the function u and touches at a single point because at that point they take exactly the same value. Is everybody willing to buy that? I'll purchase it. He just has to be different. Newsflash, nobody in this room is special. Nobody on this earth is special. <laughs> Don't believe the hype. We're all snowflakes. What are you saying, Zach? Uh, <laughs> see We're all special comments. little snowflakes. <laughs> but you look like you have a question about this, Brittany. Oh, <laughs> Do, do I always look that clueless? Is it just like my face? <laughs> Let's not say clueless. Let's instead say that you look inquisitive. I was going to say curious. Yes. No, um, no. Ignorant this, and inquisitive. <laughs> no, uh, it's just the lack of sleep. I'm just a little like, you know. Uh... So think of it this way. I'll write it slightly differently. So that way we can see it in a, a different format. If it turns out that I have two functions that have derivatives, and I know that they have a maximum, uh, the difference has some maximum at a point x naught, then at that point x naught, according to what we know about functions and calculus, the derivatives ought to be equal to one another. Well, that's exactly what happens here. The right-hand side has a derivative. The left-hand side has a derivative. They're equal at the point x naught, and otherwise, the function on the right hand side, which I've represented by a blue line that looks parabolic ish, is larger or greater than or equal to the left hand side. So that means that we have some kind of maximum or minimum. And according to calculus, the derivatives of the right and the left must be equal to one another. That's the second piece of information we can glean from this apparently very open question. The last thing we can glean actually directly references Taylor's theorem. If you were to expand the left-hand side of our inequality up above using Taylor's theorem, what you would find out, because we know already that uh, by Taylor's theorem, the left-hand side is going to be u of x naught plus the derivative, which we know is the same thing as eta, inner product with x naught minus x plus a matrix term. The relationship is actually telling us that the matrices have the relationship in point three. The Hessian for u at x naught must be less than or equal to the matrix on the right-hand side. Now, I would look at Nathan's face or uh, Lewis's or Fudong's, but Brittany has such an expressive face that I can tell she's looking at this and thinking to herself, well, why on God's green earth do I care? I was just, I was just saying that to someone uh, today, actually, that a lot of people say I'm very expressive. Um, people say that to me too. I don't understand that one, but I can speak from personal experience looking at you and say that you are indeed very expressive. Yeah, and I can tell you're looking at I can't at deny something. it, yeah. Um, you're thinking to yourself something along the lines of, okay, Zach, why do we care? <laughs> yeah, so, something. Yeah, one of many thoughts, but yeah, that is. <laughs> okay, well, yeah. let's think about this. We already know, and I'll circle the parts that we already Number know and the three. parts that I'm we're sorry. getting Number out of this. We already know, because of our assumptions, that U holds this relationship. If you plug in X, or well, really, this should be X naught here, my bad. If you plug in X naught, U of X naught, the gradient of u at x naught and the Hessian of u at x naught into our function f, the result is zero. We already know that. But we also know that the function f is proper and degenerate elliptic. What does that mean? 
Well, that means, among other things, that if we get a larger matrix in the very last component, that F ought to decrease as long as everything else remains the same. And sure enough, everything else does remain the same. The left and right-hand side of that inequality above are identical at X naught. The vectors are exactly the same. The only real difference is the matrix term. So if the matrix increases, the function F decreases. Well, the first entry, oh, you want X naught in both of them, okay. Yes. Good so far? This right here kind of looks like what we're doing is we're producing what's called a subsolution. A subsolution is any time that you plug in a function and the function ends up producing something a little bit less than our original intended output. We want to get zero. We're plugging in eta and x instead of the derivatives for u. And we're coming up with something a little bit smaller than zero, maybe equal to zero, maybe not, but a little bit smaller. So it looks like what we've actually done is we've built a subsolution out of our classical solution. Everybody with me? Okay, once again, we have questions upcoming about why we care. So let's show why we care. It actually turns out that we're very fortunate and this sort of build can be repeated if we go the other direction. In this case, because of the way things work out, we'll have built a super solution, same idea as subsolution. It's just going the opposite way. We're a little bigger instead of the equal to. So what we're actually saying here is that as long as we choose ordered pairs of vectors and matrices carefully, we actually can produce seven super solutions. So the question is this, what if, I couldn't actually say that this exists or that exists. I know that there are vectors and matrices regardless of the existence of derivatives for you. What if I replace the spots where I say the derivatives ought to go with vectors and matrices instead? According to what I saw a second ago, as long as they satisfy Taylor's theorem looking inequalities, what I should be able to do is claim that there's some kind of sub and super solution relationship going on between the actual, uh, the inputs I've got and the operator, the result of the operator that I want to get. That is going to be our goal. We are going to replace all of the derivatives of our functions u by vectors, matrices, and they're just going to satisfy an inequality. So now the seeming issue is how can you guarantee existence of such pairs, yeah? This is a very tricky thing. Of course, one of the things that you can take as an immediate example, I was going to save this, but there's no point really in saving it when I have such a great question. Oh, Nathan-san, you give me such great questions. One of the results of having such a great question is, of course, if you happen to be differentiable at that point, well, then the gradient at x naught and the Hessian at x naught would actually be a vector and a matrix which satisfy both inequalities at x naught. So in a situation like that, it would be good enough. What you would have would be an appropriate vector matrix combination. Now, would there be more? Yeah, maybe from what we've seen already, if we choose a larger uh, matrix or a smaller matrix, we can get sub and super solutions. So probably the collection of things we're gonna be looking at eventually is a little bit bigger than just this particular ordered pair. But in the situation like that, we definitely would have non-empty. We definitely would have a pair of a vector and a matrix. Everybody willing to buy that so far? All right, so enough yapping and flapping of gums. Let's go ahead and uh, make sure that everybody knows. I'm not gonna go through the definition here, but it's here if you need it. This is what we mean when we talk about upper and lower semi-continuous functions. We're gonna use these in just a minute and I'll return if you need it. Here's an example of what upper and, semi, uh, upper and lower semi-continuous functions look like if you want a visual when we come back. What we're going to do is Wait, the hold following. on, so sorry, sorry. Could <laughs> yes. you go back here? <laughs> Can I stare? No, no, no. The picture. Do you mind if I stare at it for a second? 
Um, sure, you can stare at it as long as you like. I spend a good amount of time on that, so I'll feel better and better with every passing moment. Yeah, it's a, it's a I, I no, I appreciate that. I'm you know I'm very visual. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It's a good picture too, because essentially lower sem lower and upper semi-continuous functions are continuous functions which are allowed to have some discontinuities, and the kinds of discontinuities are exactly the ones pictured. Okay. So only jump and jumps of that kind. Okay. Yeah, they're very nicely behaved for a lot of things. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to assume that O is just open in Rn. We aren't actually sure whether it's all of Rn. We don't know if it is bounded or not. It's just open for right now. That'll be enough for our definition. We're going to have an upper semi-continuous function U over O, which basically means like Nathan said, it may be discontinuous, but the discontinuities are not too bad. They're mostly jump discontinuities. We're going to fix any point X naught in O. If it turns out that somehow the gods smile upon us and we find a vector matrix pair with the property that they satisfy this Taylor's theorem-like inequality that we were staring about, uh, uh, staring about, staring at a few moments ago, then what we're going to do is say that that vector matrix pair belongs to what we will call the second order superjet for U at X naught. It has ugly looking notation, but it basically just means it approximates uh, Taylor's theorem at that point from above. In a situation like this, and I'll point this out here, we really want upper semi-continuous. Continuous would be fine, but it's a lot of assumptions on our function, and we don't want that many. Upper semi-continuous guarantees that the discontinuities are so nicely controlled that we still may have a hope of satisfying an inequality like this one. We can also go the opposite direction. If we have a lower semi-continuous function, what we can do is we can say that uh, rho and y, a vector matrix pair, belong to the second order subjet at x naught for v. If it turns out that the negative of rho and the negative of y belong to the superjet for the negative of v. Now that looks hideous. That looks really, really hideous. So let's go back to our picture for a moment and understand why I would say such a horrible thing to you. Look at our function v here, which I say is lower semi-continuous. If we multiplied every single bit of v by a negative, so if we flipped it about the x-axis, we would wind up with something that looks a lot like u. In other words, we would wind up with an upper semi-continuous function. So basically, what I'm saying here is that v is, if v is lower semi-continuous, then we know that the vector matrix pair belongs to the subject whenever we reverse everything, we end up with a upper semi-continuous function negative v, and we prove that negative vector negative matrix belongs to the superjet. It also works out really nicely. It sounds horrible, but it works out very, very nicely. Because if we change the signs on everything, you'll have negative v of x and then less than or equal to, because that's what I'm saying when I talk about the superjet, negative v at x naught, and then plus the negative of eta times the difference of the two points, plus one half times the negative of y times difference of two points times difference of two points, like so and then plus some other part over here we don't care about too much. Well, every single one of those things has a negative on it. So if the matrix and the vector satisfy this inequality, if I make everything positive here, the inequality must reverse. Is it completely coincidental that this looks a little bit like um, your definition of, what was it, weak derivative or earlier? Or no. It's not entirely a coincidence, but as it turns out, our weak derivative wow. definition, um, it has only integrable information. It has information over sets that are kind of larger. 
our information here is much more localized to one point and the area just around that one point. So it's a little bit of a, a smaller dragging of the net to figure out what we can do, I suppose. Okay. I'll also go ahead and say right now that most of the time you don't see the second order subject criterion talked about exactly this way. There's an easier way to write down exactly the same thing. Since as we saw, if we can show that uh, the negative of rho, negative of y belongs to the superjet for the negative of v, in fact, we can actually change the criterion and just say the subjet for v is nothing more than the negative of the superjet for negative v. That's the relationship between the two of them. Makes it much easier and much nicer to talk about. So I have a question, just to sort yes. of summarize what you were doing. So at the very beginning, we're trying to find, uh, we're trying to solve third clip problem for some second order operator f. Mm -hmm. So we're looking for you to solve this third clip problem. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, are we actually getting any closer to getting a solution if we know the sub and super solutions or? Yes, we are. So here's the thing, Lois, and this is a good question. I'm glad you're bringing me back down to the matter at hand when you ask questions like that. The fact of the matter is that if we're going to not say that U has derivatives necessarily, we have to replace them by something. When we're doing weak solutions in the case of Sobolev derivatives, what we're doing is we're saying that instead of having normal derivatives, we can replace anywhere you see a derivative normally by a function that behaves like the derivative. In our case, we're not doing that. We want to have more pointwise behavior. So instead, what we're doing is we're saying, okay, listen, as preparation for the type of solutions we want to talk about, we're going to replace derivatives by vectors and matrices from vectors and matrices, we'll be able to actually talk about what sub and super solutions look like and how they mimic the derivative behaviors. And then from there, we'll be able to actually talk about the, the properties and the behaviors of these sorts of solutions. Does that kind of give you an idea of our trajectory? Yeah, kind of. Also, I think you might run out of time here. Yeah, I very well might not. <laughs> I think uh, Nathan already pointed out, I have I just realized something slides just for the first two sections. But you mean you made more progress than the analysis seminar. I'll give you that. <laughs> I just realized it's 2.30 already. Wow. So, well, you want to finish? Flies when you're having fun. <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll do a part two, for sure. Um, of course. The same time next week work for you? Uh, yeah, that should be fine. OK, so we'll schedule the new. And if I could do half of the notes, approximately, in uh, a week, I should be able to do the other half of the notes in a week, right? That's how that works. That's yeah. symmetry. Yeah, something like that. Symmetry. <laughs> so did you want to finish um, whatever you were saying now? Um, how about, let's see what we can get through. You tell me when to stop and we'll just uh, keep going until you're willing to tell me to shut up. Okay, it's up to everyone else. Yeah, no, I don't mind. I don't have, you know, I don't have anywhere to be. Um, it's not like you have a seminar to go to. <laughs> 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 It's not like I have a life or anything. <laughs> You're a mathematician. Of course you don't. <laughs> okay. So I was going to go through this uh, calculation here. I was going to give you the function negative of the absolute value of X for uh, real X as a function and say, calculate the upper and lower semi-jets. I'll leave this to you guys to work on. I claim that this is the answer until somebody says I'm wrong, at which point I claim that I made no errors. It was the universe that did me dirty. <laughs> uh, in a situation like this, basically what it's saying, it's actually kind of giving a nod to the problems we normally see when we talk about absolute value and the negative of absolute value, right? With negative of absolute value, we have a function that looks like this with this nasty little cusp here at zero. So the problem is, if you want to start drawing pictures again, like I was doing before, and try to draw polynomials, basically quadratic polynomials that touch at the point zero, up top, it's super easy. I can just do this, and look at that. I have a quadratic polynomial that touches from above. Woohoo! I can put that into my super jet as long as I figure out what the vector and the matrix are. But once I get inside, 
trying to get something that doesn't end up going outside the lines is very difficult. In fact, mm -hmm. I claim that it's not possible. So this is kind of an example of what happens. You'll see that they're actually not that far away from the real derivative properties we have come to know and love over our careers. They just look a little bit funkier. Uh, I really appreciate the pictures, by the way. This is, you know. I found over time, I didn't used to draw them, and now I found over time they're almost indispensable for clearing up small things. Yeah, I, I don't find a lot. I'm, I just, uh, you know, when there are all these like definitions and all these words, <laughs> all these pesky words, um, I don't know. When I'm studying, I, I try to translate things in, in the text into like pictures and visuals and other, you know, whatever. So that's, I, I understand it better that way. I don't know if anyone else feels like that. So. I'm sure. sure they do. I know I do. Uh, I don't always use them, but when I do, I use Dos Equis. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. And uh, so this is another really great uh, remark, if I do say so myself, although it's not strange since similar remarks are in the user's guide. Kind of like Fudong was talking about before, continuous, well, actually not, yeah, continuous, even Lipschitz continuous functions may not have a jet entry, at a certain point. You may be able to find a point where it turns out that you can't find any jet entries that work, in which case the jets would end up being empty. And as it turns out, we're very lucky in how I worded the definition. It's not just luck, of course, I wrote, I read in advance, so I was able to say this for sure. But had we not chosen to work with an open set, things might have changed for our uh, jets. Our jets might have been different had we tried to define them with closed or semi-closed intervals. But in our case, because we are specifically saying from the beginning, if we want to work with a jet, we need to have an open neighborhood of our point. It turns out that it doesn't matter which open neighborhood you pick, your jets are going to be well-defined in every single one of them. Another thing that I want to point out here, and this makes the jets a lot easier to understand, is kind of like we were talking about. We're basically saying that U is being touched from above or from below by a function which is C2, like this. That's basically what we're talking about when we talk about the jets. Well, as it turns out, this isn't just a happy little accident. This is a little bit more than just a happy accident. It's actually a theorem that you can make. You need a definition for what it means when we talk about functions touching from above, which is what TA stands for, or touching from below. But it turns out that if you want to talk about the jets, another way to talk about them is they're ordered pairs of gradients and hessians for C2 functions. And the only requirement is the C2 functions have to touch our functions either from above or from below. Pictatorially, this also works very well with this notion of upper semi-continuous and lower semi-continuous from what we had before. So now we're finally ready to talk about what we mean when we say solutions in the viscosity sense. Isn't viscosity theory great? So when we want to talk about super solutions in the viscosity sense to an equation that looks kind of like, and I guess I'll write it up here, as f of u or f of w is equal to zero. What we're talking about when we say a super solution is that uh, u has to be lower semi-continuous. It has to be not identically equal to negative infinity. And at every single point where we have a jet entry, we have to satisfy this relationship right here if we replace the normal gradient and Hessian entries in our function f by the vector and the matrix coming from the jet. Or if we want to say this a little bit differently using our theorem from a second ago, which I'll flash in front of Brittany's eyes in a slightly perverted fashion, I suppose, since I'm using those words. You could also write it a little bit differently and instead say every single time you have a point in our open set O, and you have a function which touches U from below at that point, then we could replace U by our C2 function touching from below, and you get this relationship.
kind of like what we did before, we don't actually have to spell out exactly what it means when we talk about a subsolution. Once we have the definition for super solution, all we have to do is say u is a subsolution if negative u is a super solution. And if it turns out that u is both a viscosity sub and a viscosity super solution, the result is that we have a viscosity solution overall. And that kind of makes sense, because if we were talking about classical solutions, if we had a function that was twice differentiable and it turned out that if this is zero, we have this relationship and then we also have this relationship here, then we would expect that overall f of u would end up being zero. Same idea here, we're just pawning off the derivatives on touching above and touching below functions. Everybody okay with this? There's a lot here, but luckily conceptually, you can shorten it down a bit, which is nice. There are some also very nice takeaways from this. Uh, the first takeaway is that if you use a viscosity solution, not sub or super, both sub and super, it has to be continuous. So that actually means that we don't need to talk about functions that are differentiable in any sense. They can just be continuous and that's good enough for us. Another thing is that if U happens to be a classical solution, so it's C2, then of course it's also a viscosity solution. And that means, among other things, that when we're looking for viscosity solutions, we know that anything that would have been a classical solution fits into the viscosity solution. So we're working with a broader family of solutions. And we also have another interesting little fact here, which sounds a little bit arcane, but it's not bad. If I have a function u, which has a point x naught where both the uh, sub and the super jet are non-empty, and they have a point of intersection, they'll intersect at only one point, one ordered pair, eta and x. And moreover, eta and x will turn out to be the derivatives of u at that point. So it will turn out that x will be twice differentiable at that point, x naught. That seems kind of funky. I don't know. It does seem kind of weird. It just turns out that this has to make sense because if you look at the uh, inequality, for example, you're saying u is less than or equal to u at x naught plus some inner product plus one half, some other inner product like that, plus some junk we don't care about. But then it's also greater than or equal to, well, exactly the same thing because our ordered pair a to x belongs to both the sub and the super jet. So if u is greater than or equal to exactly the same thing every single time must be equal to. So in this case, we actually have a Taylor's expansion for u at the point x naught. So that would mean that we actually have derivatives. It's the short and sweet version of it. Uh, let's say short and tolerable. So at this point, we're verging onto a new section where we actually have proofs. So I guess the question for you guys is this. Do you want to do a little bit longer? Do you want to try and finish this section and just go over time? Do you want to save this for next time? I say we start. Uh, <coughs> what? Wait, are you saying Pardon? that you would like to not necessarily start not from the beginning? But... <laughs> no, <laughs> you do that too well. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dina, I must tell you that I find this comment uh, very suspect. Okay. Uh, Nathan, I didn't hear what you said. <laughs> <laughs> I was distracted by Rachmanov's uh, doppelganger. Zachmanov. Zachmanov, yeah. <laughs> so I say we start this next time because um, it looks like a good breaking point. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, if you want to say any kind of, I don't know. Um, yeah, so actually, um, I think that's probably a great idea. I wanted to give you guys more to think about in terms of proofs and stuff, but I think that this has kind of ended up naturally <clears throat> uh, pacing out to what people understand, so that's perfect. I'm more than meant happy it to be that way, right? That, that's, it worked I mean, out. 
this wildly exceeded my highest expectations for the slowness of the talk. So that is fantastic. <laughs> Uh, so I guess what I'll do is I'll just kind of flash in front of you some of the ideas we're going to talk about next time, which will let you prepare. I was going to ask you, yes. And if you want, I'll even send out my partially finished um, presentation, which now is devoid of swearing. It wasn't this morning when I flashed it in front of some of my students. Oops. Um, <laughs> but I'll kind of flash in front of you what you have to look forward to. So What's going to happen is this. This next time, we're going to be talking about things like Dirichlet problems, although they don't have to be. We just have to have some kind of boundary information for the relationships between sub and super solutions in the viscosity sense. We're going to try and figure out how to compare them. And the very first thing we're going to introduce is a principle called the maximum principle. The general goal of the maximum principle, which looks absolutely hideous, and you can see what I'm talking about when I say there's a lot to unpack in any paper that has anything to do with Lyons is if you take two functions that should technically be just acting on O, you double the number of variables and you add in this function here, which I'm going to call a penalty function. The result is that you can wind up finding these points, X alpha and Y alpha in O, that wander toward a point of maximum for U of X minus V of X. They will not necessarily in and of themselves give me the maximum, but if there is a maximum to be found, then it will turn out that the limit is going to wind up going towards that maximum as alpha goes to infinity. And on top of that, we'll be able to show that the penalty function ends up contributing nothing as alpha goes to infinity, even though alpha is going to infinity. That'll be the first of the major tools we need, although it doesn't seem immediately obvious why that should be the case. That's the proof right there, succinctly stated. After that, we're going to introduce another horrible looking theorem, which we call the theorem of sums. Theorem of sums is what's going to interest both uh, Fudong and Nathan, because it gives conditions under which we can find non-empty jets for general upper semi-continuous functions. It looks horrible. The conditions look awful, but it's actually not as bad as it sounds, especially not the way we're going to use it, because the plot is going to be this. We're going to take sub and super solutions. We're going to apply the maximum principle so that we can find points X alpha and Y alpha heading towards a maximum. At each of those points, thanks to the theorem of sums, we'll be able to find non-empty jets, and that will allow us to fruitfully compare U and V our sub and super solutions when we plug them into our equation F. From there, we will hope that magic happens and we're able to produce some kind of proof that one is smaller than the other, specifically that U is less than or equal to V. This inequality looks weird. Oh, uh, you mean yeah. this one right here? The, the epsilon go to zero, left hand go to infinity, All right? Oh, well, we don't actually require that epsilon goes to zero in this case. But um, they for every epsilon positive. Yeah, just for every epsilon positive. Fix an epsilon positive and we can do what we want. Oh, so it's uh, fixed. Okay. In fact, uh, and so I'm, I'll talk about this next time if I have to actually dig into the proof. But you'll notice here, this is actually another version of the same basic inequality, severely reduced, but suddenly you've got alphas and threes hanging out. Well, the idea here is you choose epsilon nicely. And if you choose epsilon nicely, because of the way that we've done everything else, you're going to reduce down the expression. Instead of having epsilon and one over epsilon thrown in, you'll just have negative three alpha or three alpha as a coefficient, and that's it. Yeah, I remember this theorem from Tom's class. Uh, it is a uh, theorem of sums is hideous. In fact, the way that it's displayed in uh, the user's guide, it's stated more or less exactly like this. Then they say that we're going to delay the proof and put it into the appendices. And then basically all of the appendices for the entire nearly book worth of paper is just proving this thing using what they call, I think, infimal convolutions. I just remember it being nasty. It's very technically ugly. But the theorem is useful though, I guess. So there's that at least.
<laughs> it looks hideous, but here's the great thing. It's good at Scrabble. It has a great personality, I'm sure. That's right. <laughs> Introduce it to your friends. <laughs> oh, man. So um, with that, I guess, uh, should we conclude? Hi, Zach. <laughs> oh, um, actually, uh, I mean, I know you like, you know, uh, skimmed through section two already, but I don't know, uh, like, how, what does this matter in the scheme of like, why should I care? <laughs> All right. So this so is what. So there are a couple of interesting results you can find thanks to viscosity solutions. So. I kind of gave away the basic approach to what we're going to be doing here uh, this next time around, but it's also written here on the page. Basically what's gonna happen is we're gonna be able to use the theorem of sums and the maximum principle in order to compare a sub and a super solution. What we'll do is we'll say, oh, well, it turns out that the sub solution is less than or equal to the super solution on the boundary of say a domain but we'll assume just to reach a contradiction that there is some point where if I take U of X and V of X and I subtract them like this, I get something positive, which would indicate that U is greater than V in the, in the inside somewhere. Then what we do is we say, okay, well, that really is a maximum of the difference between U and V. Maximum principle lets us wind through the set until we reach that point. And at each point, as we wind our way through Omega, eventually we're going to have jet entries. The jet entries and all the other nasty stuff that we saw, the inequalities will let us show that this assumption leads to an obvious contradiction. And so that will guarantee that we can't say something stupid like this. And instead it must actually be uh, more profitably, not less than or equal to V on the boundary, but less than or equal to V everywhere. In particular, if I have a, a, a pair of solutions and I know they're equal on the boundary for whatever reason, say they're solving a Dirichlet type problem and they have to be equal on the boundary. Well, in a situation like that, U is a solution, so that makes it a subsolution. V is a solution, so that makes it a super solution because that's what we said for our definition. Well, by our comparison principle, U must be less than or equal to V inside the set. Oh, but wait a second. U is a, su a super solution because it's a solution. V is a subsolution because it's a solution. Oh, so V must be less than or equal to U inside the set. Oh, well, wait a second. U is less than or equal to V is less than or equal to U. They're equal to one another. So it's a unique solution. Okay, nice. Thank you. <laughs> all right. I guess that's all I have to say for today before I say much too much. Okay, so uh, let's thank our speaker one more time then, I guess. I, I still don't yes, know how to say it. It's been like a year I now. I think that's good enough. I mean, that's what you do in real life, right? Clap. Let's thank our speaker. I yeah. <laughs> for something. Presumably, he enriched our lives. <laughs> Stop recording.